Four years ago, I stood at the Bioneers podium and spoke as a cancer patient. I asked my audience to imagine a future in which the deliberate introduction of chemical carcinogens into our environment would be considered as unthinkable as the practice of slavery. I said that I was seeing the beginning of an environmental human rights movement for which the animating vision was emancipation from our economy's desperate dependency on fossil fuels, which were killing the planet via climate change and killing ourselves via toxic exposure. My talk today is a dispatch from the front lines of that ongoing movement. However, I'm not the same person who stood here four years ago. Back then, I had left the coal mines and coal plants of the Illinois River Valley where I grew up and was raising two kids in a small house in a rural county in upstate New York, surrounded by lakes, farms, pastures, vineyards, and fields of heirloom organic wheat. I didn't know then, nor did my neighbors, that the bedrock under our feet contained a mother load of methane, the vaporous form of petroleum called natural gas. I didn't know that the world's largest, most powerful industry was coming after it, proposing to use our drinking water as the club to smash the shale apart. I hadn't yet heard the word fracking, which is quite possibly the world's ugliest gerund. 40% of the land in my county is now leased to the gas industry, some inside my own village. High volume slick water horizontal hydraulic fracking is not yet permitted in New York State, and yet 20 miles from my house along the west bank of Seneca Lake, an energy company has purchased depleted salt caverns and is repurposing them for the storage of fracked gas from Pennsylvania. Absent our intervention, we in the Finger Lakes region are to become a transportation and storage hub for methane and propane extracted throughout the Northeast, a transformation that will require the massive industrialization of our peaceful agrarian community by an accident-prone, carcinogen-dependent industry. Already there have been toxic leaks. Already compressor stations, flare stacks, pipeline construction. Already test wells, chemical storage depots, fleets of tanker trucks, radioactive drill cuttings heading for landfills. Already the farmers of heirloom organic wheat and the millers and bakers who depend on them cannot expand their operations to meet local demand for bread because the wheat fields are boxed in by land leased for drilling. So as a witness to all this change, I too am changed. Last month, a man knocked on my door. He invited me to come with him the following morning. He and some other locals were going to be chaining themselves to the fence of the Seneca Lake facility. As they were being arrested, would I speak to the press about formaldehyde emissions from the compressor station? Formaldehyde is a known human carcinogen. Would I speak about the exemptions granted in 2005 from the Safe Drinking Water Act and key provisions of the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act? Because of them, chemicals used in drilling and fracking operations can be claimed as trade secrets. Public release of their identity is not mandated by federal right to know provisions which govern other industries. High volume slick water horizontal hydraulic fracturing could be considered a crime if the requirements of our federal laws applied, but they don't. Would I talk about that? I did. The next morning, 17 people blocked the gate, the oldest of which was 85. At age 53, I was one of the youngest. In the end, three people were arrested for trespassing, including a retired Methodist minister who loves to fish. Another of those arrested went to jail for 15 days. Her name is Susan Walker. She is a mother and a nurse, and she's my age. The summer before all this, I traveled across the country to research the public health effects of fracking. I happened to be in Salt Lake City in July, on the day that University of Utah graduate student Tim DeChristopher was sentenced to prison for disrupting, three years earlier, the auction of public lands for oil and gas drilling. Tim had participated in the auction as a bidder, and indeed had won many bids, but without the millions of dollars in his bank account to back them up. The publicity surrounding his actions revealed that the auctioning of these lands was illegal, and, and thus they were saved from fracking. But that outcome did not prevent Tim from being charged with fraud. 
and on July 26, 2011, he was sentenced to two years in federal prison. I was at the courthouse when it happened. In the most extraordinary moment, Tim said to the judge, I am not asking for mercy. I am asking for you to join me. Tim said, this is what love looks like. Those words changed me. Soon after, I received a phone call letting me know that I was a lucky recipient of a Heinz Award for my research and writing on environmental health. It's an award that comes with a $100,000 cash prize. So I went into the desert and thought hard. The words of Tim De Christopher were with me. It didn't take me long to decide to donate the award to the fight against fracking. It's not an act of philanthropy, it's an act of survival. And with that decision was birthed a coalition called New Yorkers Against Fracking, which has grown to include 180 groups and over 1,000 businesses. Together we are building the fracking abolitionist movement in New York. In our alliance are artists against fracking, faith leaders against fracking, wineries against fracking, elected officials against fracking, and there are now more than 400 of those, chefs against fracking, and we are currently working on doctors against fracking, because that is what love looks like. Thank you, Tim. Last August, New Yorkers Against Fracking, together with our friends at 350.org, Green Umbrella, and other groups, organized a march and a rally in Albany. For this event, I was given a weighty writing assignment, composed the first draft of a pledge that would express our solemn commitment to nonviolent resistance should fracking move forward in New York. Here's the final iteration of that pledge, to which many people contributed and five lawyers vetted. The pledge to resist fracking in New York. I believe that high volume horizontal hydraulic fracking is an accident prone, inherently dangerous industrial process with risks that include catastrophic and irremediable environmental damage. I believe that these risks cannot be properly resolved, nor can they be mitigated through any regulation by any government agency, let alone one that has colluded with the gas industry over the last four years in creating the rules that attempt to regulate fracking. I believe that Governor Cuomo and this agency, the Department of Environmental Conservation, have repeatedly turned a deaf ear to the petitions of New York scientists, economists, medical professionals, and ordinary citizens who have tried again and again for four years to little avail, to alert the agency and the governor to the many dangers that hydraulic fracking poses to our health, safety, property values, peace of mind, and to the climate itself. I believe that it is wrong to shatter the bedrock of New York State and inject it with toxic chemicals. Hence, if Governor Cuomo permits high volume horizontal hydraulic fracking in any part of New York, I pledge to join with others to engage in nonviolent acts of protest including demonstrations and other nonviolent actions as my conscience leads me. I make this pledge in order to prevent the destruction and poisoning of New York State, its water, air, and food systems on which life, health, and economic prosperity all depend, including that of future generations. So in the two months since those words were written, over 6,000 New Yorkers have signed the Pledge to Resist Fracking, and I am one of them. As both signatory and author of this document, it is my fervent hope that we never will have to activate it. I hope that the powers of the signatures alone will do the work to change the course of providence. I don't want to write words that fill jail cells. And yet, it is my abiding responsibility to protect my children from harm and plan for their future. And my neighbors feel the same way. If the air, food, and water out of which our children's bodies are constructed are contaminated, we can't do our job as parents. If the day comes when I can be a better mother inside of jail than outside, I will be that mother.
And as fellow pledge signer Bill McGibbon reminds us, going to jail is not the end of the world. Only the end of the world is the end of the world. <laughs> Let me now take you down into the shale bedrock, a landscape that none of us has ever seen, but whose integrity is bound up with our own. Parts of many states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, Maryland, Texas, Colorado, Arkansas, to name some, are underlain by a foundation that was previously the floor of an ancient ocean. The seafloor that I live above, the Marcellus Shale, is 400 million years old. Its rock is made from the pressed particles of silt that drifted down from eroding mountains, which also contributed to the seafloor a whole periodic chart of elements, uranium, barium, strontium, radium, mercury, arsenic, lead. The ocean above it was full of life, plankton, sea lilies, squid. But when these sea creatures died and sank to the bottom, they didn't decompose. Instead, the oxygen-poor water of 400 million years ago, their bodies transformed into gaseous bubbles of methane, which became trapped in the silt that over eons hardened into shale. This fizz of petrified bubbles is fracking's quarry. But this deep shale is not just a graveyard. It's alive today. It's a habitat. It's an ecosystem that supports communities of contemporary living organisms. The life inside the bedrock consists of simple organisms, but they can form complex colonies, sending nanowires out to the surrounding rocks to transfer electrons. In fact, geologists now suspect that the total biomass of life contained within deep geological strata exceeds that living here on Earth's sunlit surface. The biosphere then extends much farther into the dark, stony heart of the planet than any of us had ever fully appreciated. Ergo, deep life organisms almost certainly play a role in the global carbon cycle and may, in ways that we don't fully understand, help in stabilizing the Earth's climate. During fracking operations, these organisms will grow inside the pipes, interfering with the flow of gas. That's the reason powerful poisons called biocides are used in fracking fluid. And that's one reason fracking fluid is so toxic. You can think of fracking as a hostage exchange program. It buries a surface resource vital to life, fresh water, and brings to the surface poisonous substances that were once locked away in deep geological strata. It works like this. First, a drill bit opens a hole a mile deep, turns sideways, and then tunnels horizontally through the bedrock. The hole is lined with a casing of cement and steel. To initiate the fracturing process, explosives are sent down it. Then fresh water, millions of gallons per well, is injected under high pressure to further break up the shale and shoot acid, biocides, and sand grains deep into the cracks. The sand grains hold the stone doors ajar, and the, and the gas trapped for 400 million years is now free to flow through the propped open fractures. Here are some possible health threats of fracking for us. It starts with a strip mining of sand in the Midwest, which turns the earth inside out and sends silica dust into the air. Silica dust is a known cause of lung cancer and silicosis. Before it is sent down the borehole, the fresh water used to fracture the bedrock is mixed with inherently toxic materials. These include known and suspected carcinogens, neurological toxicants, and chemicals linked to pregnancy loss. These chemicals can spill, and they do. At least 1,000 truck trips are required to frack a single well. These trucks, along with earth-moving equipment, compressors, and condensers, release or create soot, volatile organic compounds, and ozone. Exposure to this kind of air pollution has demonstrable links to asthma, stroke, heart attack, cancer, and preterm birth, the leading cause of disability in the United States. Cement is not immortal, and yet the well casings do not form a permanent, unbreachable seal between the drinking water aquifers and volatile organic compounds trapped in the shale bedrock and mobilized during fracking operations. If that's true, then irreparable problems can be created as cement ages and crumbles or cracks under the repeated explosions and intense pressures of fracking. The best data we have suggests 7% of wells leak immediately. 
What percent leak after five years, after 20, after a century? Is fracking laying time bombs under the earth? And who gets to decide? These are not mitigatable, resolvable problems. There is no technological fix for shattered shale or the migration of toxic chemicals through it. Four years ago, I stood on this stage and described the beginning of an environmental human rights movement. I thought then that it was my job to provide good science to its leadership. I thought it was not my job to tell you what to do. Today, I'm a fully-fledged member of the anti-fracking wing of this larger movement, and I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> Are you ready? Join us. To those who live on the West Coast, Californians Against Fracking has a nice ring to it. Join us. To my colleagues in science, objectivity and neutrality are not the same thing, and silence is consent. Join us. Whoa. To the Sierra Club, to the National Resources Defense Council, and, and the Environmental Defense Fund, stop trying to regulate an abomination. Come out for a ban and stand with the grassroots. And for all of us, let's work together to write a new narrative with new metaphors. Shale gas is not a bridge, it's a wall. It's not a genie already out of the bottle. It's a barbaric and cynical energy choice that can be unchosen and replaced with renewable energy. Let's all say together that the shale is our Greensboro lunch counter. The ongoing uprising in Ohio and New York and Pennsylvania and Colorado is our Stonewall riot. It is our march to the sea. In creating this new narrative, Let's make art and music and science all dance together, as they always do in any human rights struggle. And to show you how we do it in New York, I'm going to close with this clip from the forthcoming film, Dear Governor Cuomo, which is directed by John Bowermaster and Alex Gibney. Cue the film. an ancient ocean floor suffused with heavy metals, radioactivity, and methane. The Marcellus Shale, our bedrock, our subterranean coral reef. The gas inside the Marcellus is scattered like a fizz of tiny bubbles, a petrified spill of champagne. Until a few years ago, it was too difficult and too unprofitable to capture. Enter an extreme form of fossil fuel extraction called high volume horizontal hydraulic fracturing. Fracking. A drill bores straight down, turns sideways, and tunnels through the bedrock horizontally like a robotic mole. Explosives are sent down the hole. Boom. A 400 million year old world cracks open. Boom. Frack. Up the borehole flows the gas. Some of the water used to shatter the shale remains entombed among the shards, forever removed from the hydrological cycle. But the rest comes flying back out of the hole with the gas, bringing with it benzene, brine, radon, heavy metals. We have no plan in place for the safe containment of this lethal flowback. 
a million or more gallons for every well. Each well is a chimney in the earth, venting toxic gases into our communities. Each well requires an access road, a five-acre well pad, a spider's web of pipeline, 50,000 gallons of chemicals, four to nine million gallons of water, and at least 1,000 diesel truck trips. Between 34,000 and 95,000 wells are envisioned for upstate New York. Do the math. Thank you.